Welcome everyone to this afternoon's program, The Dressmakers of Auschwitz, the true story of the women who sew to survive with author Lucy Adlington. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on. While we meet today on a virtual platform, please take a moment to consider the importance of the lands and waters that feed our bodies and our souls. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral lands and territories of all the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who call this land home. The Dressmakers of Auschwitz, the true story of the women who sewed to survive, powerfully chronicles the stories of the women who used their sewing skills to survive the Holocaust, stitching beautiful clothes in extraordinary fashion workshop within the Auschwitz concentration camp. Author Lucy Adlington is a British historian and writer with more than 20 years specialization in social history. Her previous nonfiction titles include Stitches in Time, the story of the clothes we wear and women's lives and clothes in World War II ready for action. Her fiction titles include the award-winning young adult novel, The Red Ribbon. She runs The History Wardrobe, a series of costume presentations and has an extensive collection of vintage and antique clothing. As you listen to the program, um, please, if you have any questions, include them in the chat function um, and we will get to them after the presentation. And now please join me in welcoming author Lucy Adlington. Thank you very much for that introduction. It is a real pleasure to be joining you today. And thank you everyone who has, who has come along today or who's watching the recording. Uh, it, it, it's lovely, isn't it, to be able to connect uh, across, across the Atlantic or wherever you are in the world. And just to let you know, I'm actually in the north of England, um, somewhere between London and Edinburgh. So quite a blustery day for me today. Now, I've got a wonderful, uh, wonderful whole hour to indulge in talking to you today about one of the most remarkable aspects of history that I've ever encountered in, in a good 20 years. And I'd like to give you a little bit of introduction about my work and how I came to this to finding this, um, this extraordinary story. And then I am going to be introducing you to the dressmaking salon in Auschwitz and I'm going to be introducing you to some of the dressmakers who you can see some of the photographs here and I'm also going to be illustrating this this talk with garments and documents from my collection because one of the most enriching aspects of writing this history has been drawing on memoirs, on testimonies, on original documents from the era. I'm a clothes historian, which you may be thinking, well, clothes, history, what's the connection? And in fact, I dedicated the last two decades to looking at the ways that clothes tell stories. Clothes give information about human life, human culture, human technology, politics, art, everything. And clothes also hold memories. So as an example, I'm wearing a rather snazzy 1940s jacket. If you can see, lovely petrol blue with enormous shoulder pads. I feel like you could land a, a B-52 bomber on those. And this jacket comes from North America. I don't know who made it. I don't know who designed it. I don't know who originally wore it or how it came to be on sale in England. I bought it, I'm wearing it now. It's all part of this garment story. And too often there are stories that we don't know. But in this instance, I have had the most remarkable privilege to uncover stories that were not well known outside the immediate survivors and their families. And it has been a pleasure and a challenge to work on this book and to share it with you. The book is titled The Dressmakers of Auschwitz. And when I wrote it, it was um, a, a topic that I was very, very much absorbed in and these women's lives, you know, I, I felt very much, uh, very, very absorbed in them for several years. And yet I was not prepared for the response from readers. Uh, the book has, it, it's now an international bestseller. It is going to be translated into 22 languages and just had an offer from a publisher in the Ukraine, which is extraordinary. They've said, we want to keep going despite the war, which is a lovely example of resilience, very much a theme of the book. 
So I've been I've been overwhelmed at the response and, and delighted, of course, that the book resonates with so many people. And what I particularly love is that this is a book about sewing. And in the past, people maybe have dismissed sewing clothes. Oh, it's just fashion. It's just sewing. It's just something that mothers do or just something that the tailor down the road does. But this book very much centers the skills of tailoring and dressmaking. And for many of the women featured in the book, it literally saved their lives. This, this humble skill, or so it seems. And since I'm speaking to you now, uh, you're Canada-based, I have to mention this book, just in case you're going to mention it to me, The Taylor Project, which is a really absorbing book looking at Holocaust survivors uh, with a tailoring connection, finding new life and new work in Canada. So, a fashion salon in Auschwitz. This is the most grotesque comparison. How can you have a fashion salon, something so beautiful and glamorous and creative and indulgent in, in an extermination center, in a labor camp, in a place of horror? A fashion salon where the clients are literally ordering dresses in hell. How is it possible? Well, over the, the, the course of this talk, I hope to give you some idea of how this came about. And it came about not just because of individual choices, but also because of a regime that backed the most horrific greed and appropriation. So I want you to imagine the building, first of all, a four story building, white, gabled, and on the lower floor, the upper basement level, imagine two rooms. One room has a large wooden table with young women, and they are mostly young women, seated around it, head down, stitching. They're wearing plain cotton overalls and white headscarves. Watching over them is a booted, suited guard, one of the SS women auxiliaries. The next room next door is the fitting room. This is where we have the mirror, you have the plinth, the client stands on it, she's measured, the clothes are adjusted, pins scattered everywhere. And there's a little girl, a little girl called Rojka, who is in, in both of these rooms, picking up pins, fetch, fetching and carrying, running errands. She's only 14 years old, Rojka. Of all the women in the room, there are about 25 in total, but they come and go and some of them, when they're gone, they're never heard of again. But when they come to the, the fashion salon for the first time, they are welcomed by the capo, the head of the salon. And here she is, Marta Fuchs. I'll be telling you more about her presently. Marta Fuchs is a Jewish woman from Slovakia. She had her own salon there before the war. And now she's in charge of this fashion salon in Auschwitz. Staffed by, I say staffed, they're forced laborers, but the work is done mainly by Slovakian Jewish women with a couple of French women turn up. They are political prisoners. They had been in the French resistance. One of them is a corsetier and she was arrested. Her name's Alida de La Salle. She was arrested for distributing Nazi propaganda sandwiched between the layerings of the corsets that she made for clients. The other French woman is Marie-Lou Rosé. She was one of the, the guerrilla fighters, the partisan fighters. So quite a, quite a group of women. What are they doing there? How, how can they possibly be there? They are in a labor camp and an extermination camp in this beautiful white building, not far from the very famous uh, gateway to the main camp in Auschwitz. You, you know the gate, Arbeit Matt Frey. Work sets you free. For the case of these women, work is a means of saving their life. As Jews, as prisoners, their lives are worth almost nothing in Auschwitz. Where did this fashion salon come from? Well, it was set up in 1942 by the wife of the Auschwitz commandant. Rudolf Huss is the, the commandant in Auschwitz, and Hedwig is his wife. And 
I'm going to come to how she actually came to establish this salon, but it really is extraordinary. It's about a 10 minute walk from her, a luxury villa that she's appropriated on the edge of the main camp, not far from the old crematorium. 10 minute walk to go around and to pick clothes from this fashion salon. So to give you a sense of the context of this salon, I'm going to take you back in time a little bit to the 1930s. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about why clothes are so powerful for the Nazi regime. The Nazis were extremely well aware of the power of image. You've got Josef Goebbels, Minister of Propaganda, who manipulates every image, every bit of film footage, every photograph to present a certain image, to send messages. And clothes are all part of this. It's very gendered too. I can show you a couple of magazines here from my collection. This one is from November 1939, Frauenwarte. It's affiliated with the National Socialist Movement, a magazine for women that advertises deodorant and sewing threads. But on the front here, we see a, a very masculine, image and a very monolithic image of the military man. This is the masculine ideal, impassive, emotionless, strong, with uniform. And in contrast, the feminine message being sent out in Nazi affiliated magazines. Here we've got Die Mode fashion magazine. And this one is on sale in Berlin and Vienna. It's from November 1942. So exactly the sort of magazine that would be on the tables in the fashion salon in Auschwitz. And the clients would come in, browse these magazines, look at latest fashions and decide, I want that one. And it was the task of each seamstress in the salon to produce at least two outfits a week for their elite clients. These outfits would be collected on Saturdays by the SS officers, the men, and they would take them back to their wives once they were all finished, all embellishments on. So what a contrast in the image though, of an attractive yet modest, stylish yet practical woman. Although it's very telling that of all the fashion images shown in De Moda during the war, most of them aren't available for your ordinary German woman. Either they don't have the money or they don't have the Russian coupons. So, the power of imagery. And in fact, one of the survivors of the fashion salon in Auschwitz, she absolutely understood the power of clothes, particularly in the concentration camp system. She had a saying in German, but in English it goes, clothes make a person, rags make lice. So clothes, give us a sense of dignity, of identity. They send messages of how we want people to see us, and that might be related to class or profession or gender identity, any number of things. Clothes make a person, rags make lice. This expression comes from the young woman featured here. Her name's Hunya, Hunya Volkman. And Hunya adored making clothes. As a young girl in the town of Kezmarok in Slovakia, she had an apprenticeship, and this apprenticeship could last up to seven years. You know, this is a skilled trade, dressmaking and tailoring. Seven year apprenticeship, but she would also rush home to sew on her mother's sewing machine at home. And it was very typical for people to have a home machine, either hand cranked or if you're very fancy, electric. And so Hunya liked learning the skills of dressmaking and she loved designing her own clothes. But she felt that Kezmarok in Slovakia was perhaps too small for her talents. And she moved westwards to Germany in the 1930s. She's pictured here in 1934 and she's working in Leipzig in Germany, running her own salon. She dresses the elite of the city. Jews and non-Jews. And they come to her apartment, they are fitted, they choose designs, she creates their own elaborate designs for them. All's well and good. But this is a woman who is going to understand that clothes make a person, 
and rags make lice because the years are inexorably going to bring her to Auschwitz and more lice than she would ever wish to encounter. So if we go back to the early 1930s or rather 1933, with Hitler being voted into power, the National Socialists in power, it's only a matter of weeks before the Nazis target the fashion industry. I mean, why would the National Socialists have anything to do with the fashion trade? Well, there's partly the imagery, remember the propaganda. And so in the ladies' magazines, I've got here Die Dame, lady magazine, literally, full of uh, articles on culture, art and literature. Also images of very stylish women, both from film and from the world of the elite Nazis. Magda Goebbels and Emmy Goering would be photographed in very elegant salons wearing beautiful creations so that to the inter on the international stage, it looked like Germany was up there. And at the same time, the National Socialists were insistent on promoting German fashions, German clothes and German styles for German people. They didn't want the money to go to Paris, you know, the heart of couture at this time. They wanted German-centric fashions. You think, okay, maybe that's supporting local talent, right? No. They have a very specific meaning for German. German means not Jewish. Aryan, you know the word, that made-up pseudo-concept of... of uh, a way of categorizing people, Aryan or Jewish. So the Germans wanted to promote Aryanism, Aryanization. Okay, so what does this have to do with the fashion trade? Well, the fashion trade and the textile trade as a whole, it relies heavily, it thrives on Jewish talent and Jewish capital. There is a long tradition of Jewish skills, Jewish artisanship, and this could have been home dressmaking, or it could have been the factories that produce clothes, it could have been Jewish designers, it could be Jewish department store owners. The majority of uh, the successful department stores in Germany, particularly in Berlin, they're owned and run by Jews, as well as smaller boutiques and little tailor workshops and milliners and so on an immense amount of Jewish fashion. The Nazis want to get their hands on this and they don't want to do it fairly. So I'm going to show you now a very lovely dress from the 1930s. It's a German dress. So it links in with Hunja Volkm here, Slovakian working in Leipzig. And it gives you a sense of how clothes can have stories. So, I hope you can see all right and get the colors here. This dress dates to about 1939. I'd say, I'd say it is 39 from the styling and from other details. And you might think, oh, that's a lovely dress, just a basic little frock, really. It's a green silk crepe. So it's got a lovely floral pattern, but it tells us a lot about the German economy. I mean, clothes are brilliant for giving us insights into technology, for example, the fibers, or into trade, for example, you know, where things are being, are being exported, imported, but also into economy, because this dress is skimpy. It has a very small rolled hem. It has very narrow seams. And in terms of decorative details, there's very little to it. A little bit of elastic shearing at the throat, a little bit of fluting. What is most unpleasant about this dress, and I, you know, I always feel uncomfortable handling it even, is that it is saturated with anti-Semitism. And we need to look at the label to find out why. Not all clothes have labels. As I said at the start of the talk, not all clothes tell their story, but this one does, and I'll try and give you a close up here. So there is the label. It reads ADEFA. ADEFA is an acronym. And in English, it is the Federation of German Aryan Clothing and Textile Manufacturers. German Aryan. 
Adefa was established not long after Hitler came to power. A group of Nazi businessmen met in a beer cellar in Berlin and said, we want to get Jews out of the fashion and textile trade. We want to make it Jew free, Judenfrei. Of course, this tallies very much with the escalation of Nazi policies to render Germany Jew free, Judenfrei. And Adefa began a campaign, not only of, of besmirching Jewish talent, this allied with the Nazi propaganda, horrible images, you know, caricatures, grotesqueries, stating that Jews were polluting German women by dressing them and so on. Absolute, you know, lies, lies. And they also began a campaign to German shoppers. So this is where we come to look at the role of ordinary people and the Holocaust. Ordinary people going shopping. You might want to buy a new summer dress, or how about a new tie? And this seems such a simple, innocent thing. But groups such as Adefa, linked with the Nazis' own programs of boycotts and don't buy from Jews, they were influencing consumer choices. So when you go into a shop, Adefa is telling you, don't buy from Jews, buy only from German Aryan manufacturers. And this tie, which looks so relatively ordinary, it's just a plain rayon mixed tie. But if we look inside, this too is stamped with the Adefa label. German only production. So what are your choices? Do you say, well, I'm not gonna go into that Jewish shop. There are stormtroopers outside or my neighbors might talk. I don't want people to think anything. Or do you say, well, I'm only going to buy from Aryans. I don't want to buy from Jews because you bought into that anti-Semitism, that bigotry. Or do you continue to shop? Now, one of the most remarkable things is that elite Nazi women in Berlin continued to buy from Jewish designers because they considered them the most talented, the most stylish. Blatant hypocrisy. Well, I'm sorry to say that this, this anti-Semitism, this bigotry permeated everything, even something as simple and lovely as this booklet of knitting and crochet yarns. And this booklet is by uh, the most popular knitting yarn company in Germany, but even they here say only Aryan production. So there is one of the links between fashion and anti-Semitism. And this is allied, as I said, with the Nazi ethos, which culminates in stripping people of their German citizenship, stripping Jews, and also stripping people of their businesses. Hunya in Leipzig soon found she couldn't practice in Leipzig, even if it had just been for Jewish, uh, Jewish customers. And other people found that their companies and their shops and their workshops and their factories were being taken over by so-called Aryans. They were maybe bullied into selling for a nominal price, or it was just stolen from them. And ultimately, by the time that this dress was on sale, Germany was pretty much Jew free in terms of its textile industry. And over the next few years, the policies would escalate to render Germany essentially Jew free that from deportations and emigration. So this is a very sinister element to the fashion trade. So how do we get from here to Auschwitz? Well, the Germans found, the Nazis found, that having eliminated Jewish talent and having stolen Jewish businesses, they didn't have Jewish labor. They needed Jewish laborers to, not only to create uniforms because uh, they eventually had to use Jewish laborers, forced laborers in ghetto workshops to make SS uniforms, for example, from the company Hugo Boss, and to make Wehrmacht clothes as well but also to make civilian clothes. So the grotesque hypocrisy is that having said, we don't want clothes from Jews, they're contaminated, Jews are parasites, we only want Aryan clothes. Covertly, at least covertly to the consumers, clothes are being shipped in, in vast numbers 
from Occupy Poland, from ghetto workshops. And Hunia herself in Leipzig, she's put to work as a forced laborer in a fur factory. Leipzig is very famous for its fur trade. And somewhere amongst my magazines, I have a very glamorous image of women sorting through furs to make them into warm clothes for the Wehrmacht on the Eastern Front in Russia. Of course, the, the winter temperatures are, are deadly. However, this photograph is propaganda because it shows smiling German women, but they're not Jewish women, they're not forced laborers. And the reality is those furs were appropriated. Some of them donated by German citizens, but there was also a ruling saying Jews had to hand over their furs, their warm clothes. So these clothes being made for German soldiers were being made by Jewish hands, from, recycled, from Jewish clothes. And of course it gets worse. Now I can't give you the full history uh, of how we actually get, but there's so much, there's so much you can read about in the book. You can read about Hunya experiencing Kristallnacht, you can read about her defiance, her work with the underground and helping people in Leipzig. But I'm going to have to move forward to spring 1942. And in spring 1942, the first official Jewish transports arrive in Auschwitz, and they are also the first transports of women into Auschwitz. And of these, about 600 are Slovakian women. These first transports of Jews, they're from Slovakia, and they include Marta Fuchs, the capo of the fashion salon, and they include other people that Marta knows from Slovakia, young women, all single women in these first transports. And here we come to another element of why clothes are important. Because these young women have been told, you're going to work. You're just going to a labor camp in the East, dress accordingly. They have one suitcase. And you can read in the book about how the women decide, well, what, what am I going to pack? And this isn't a frivolous thing. If you think of winter in Poland, very harsh conditions. It's still very cold in March 1942. So they're wearing thick coats, they're wearing warm sweaters, they're wearing sturdy shoes, but they're also putting little personal things in their luggage, little mementos of home. And yet they're put onto cattle wagons to travel to this, this work camp they don't know where. And one of the the most moving descriptions of the journey comes from the two sisters here. This is Bracha and Katka Berkovich of Slovakia. Now Bracha was actually, she so-called passed as Catholic, they said. They said, oh, you don't have to go along to the deportation. You don't look Jewish. But she heard that Katka had been rounded up and she said, well, I don't want to go without my sister. And so she voluntarily reported to the, the holding camp so that she could travel with Katka to this, this work camp. And that is a really important part of this history, that camaraderie, that loyalty, those bonds between women. And it is going to be a very crucial element of how these women stayed alive, despite the fact that Rudolf Haas, the commandant of Auschwitz, said that Jews had no family feeling or they just all fought together. These women proved to the contrary, of course. So they, they traveled um, in the cattle wagons and they arrived and Bracha said, when they arrived, the doors slid open. And she said, it was just completely confusing right from the start. She was only 20 years old at the time. They had to jump down from the wagons onto a wooden ramp and she couldn't get her suitcase. She had her suitcase carefully packed, one suitcase they were allowed to bring. And she said to the SS officer, well, she, she wanted to get her suitcase. And he said to her, don't worry, we'll take care of your luggage. Well, we know what that means, but Bracha did not. So along with the other women, a thousand women on this transport, she's hustled, hustled along for processing. And they had no idea what was going to happen. And I bring you back again to Hunya's expression, clothes make a person. These clothes that the young women had so carefully dressed in all those layers, they had to come off and not in cubicles privately. This is a mass undressing with SS men and women screaming at them, beating at them, tearing jewelry from their ears and the clothes come off. 
And this isn't just a loss of your belongings, which is vile enough. They're taking away your identity. Your memories go with the clothes. And then think of these young women, unmarried women, having to undress in public, everything gone. They take your dignity. And then of course they took hair and they took the names. They took the names of these young women and gave them numbers instead. Now Hunya arrived at Auschwitz later than the other group of Slovakian women because she'd been working in Leipzig. Hunya was deported in summer 1943, the very last train of Jews from Leipzig. And I actually read one account of this transport that said, there are no known survivors from this transport. But I have to disagree because there were at least two women who survived the last transport from Leipzig and Hunya was one of them. You can read her attitude on the journey. You can read how it was for her to arrive at the camp. She said, oh, it was the customary reception. Lots of beatings and screamings. And just as they were about to leave the train, when he had been traveling with a friend of hers, Ruth, and Ruth's husband turned to Ruth and said, stick with Hunya. I have a feeling she'll make it. Great advice, great advice, because Hunya was one tough woman. She was incredibly defiant. But again, that sense of people needing each other to survive. So by the time Hunya had arrived, the fashion salon was already established. As I said, it was Hedvig Huss, the commandant's wife. So in 1942, when this first transport of Jewish women came to Auschwitz, they were put in the main camp until eventually in August they were transferred to Birkenau. And the main camp was right next to Hedvig's luxury villa, as I've said. And you can read about her life in this villa, a garden that was landscaped, by slave labor, provided with plants grown by slave labor. The house was furnished with plundered goods, plundered artwork, plundered clothes hung in the wardrobes. These clothes were taken from the luggage of deportees to Auschwitz, people who arrived and were murdered. And up in the attic of this house, there was a sewing room. Many rooms, at, many houses at this time did set aside a room for sewing. I mean, there's a lot of mending to do, you know, you didn't throw your clothes away. And Hedwig at first employed two local Christian women from, uh, from Oswiecim, from, from Auschwitz town, but she objected to paying their wages. She was stingy, basically, if you know that word. She was, she was mean, she didn't want to pay the wages. And so for her, it was a great asset. She now had a new pool of enslaved people to draw on. And Marta was selected to work at the Commandant's Villa. She was sort of like a nanny almost to start with, a domestic help. And one day Hedwig Huss had some fur and she said, I need this uh, reconditioning, I need this upcycling into a garment, whatever. And Marta said, I can do that. Now, was this because Marta wanted to work for the Nazis to the people who were exterminating hundreds of thousands? No, Marta wanted to live. And she knew as every prisoner learned in the concentration camp system that to live, you had to get work that wouldn't kill you. Because all of these women, when they first arrived in Auschwitz were put to hard labor. They were put working in quarries, sand pits. They were put working at swamp clearance, demolition work. And this young woman here, Irene Reichenberg, she actually worked building the new gas chambers at Birkenau. This work would kill anybody over time, including with the beatings and the mistreatment from the SS guards, with the illnesses, horrific illnesses, with the malnutrition. And for Irene Reichenberg, the added horror of living with depression, which I'll, I'll perhaps come back to if I get chance. So Marta said, I can, I can sew to Hedwig Huss. And Marta went up into the attic of this lovely villa and she began sewing. And what a strange situation. A villa that overlooks the concentration camp 
And you have a woman sewing, such a talented woman as well. Her speciality, she was a cutter. So she can actually draw patterns and create from 2D, 3D. So here she is in the attic sewing and there's Hedvig Huss who doesn't even see her as human. And this is shown in interchanges between the SS and the sewers. I mean, Hedwig, Hedwig said to Marta, you work beautifully and quickly. She said, I thought Jews were all con men and, and, and parasites and sat around in cafes. There's no record of what Marta said in reply. But still, Hedwig could not see that these, that the woman working for her was a human being. But Marta didn't only look to get herself a better position. Marta was incredibly kind and compassionate, what I'd call a real quiet hero. Marta is, she is a hero. She decided that she would save lives. So she said, well, there's another seamstress who can help me, a woman called Berta Weiss. And in getting Berta into the attic sewing room, she saved Berta's life. For a while at least, sadly, Berta died of illness uh, in 1944. But Berta brought with her her little niece, Rojika, who was 14. And Rojika picked up pins and did errands, right? So there's three lives saved for now. And Marta also recommended a hairdresser for Hedvig Huss. She recommended a woman called Ella Brown to knit clothes for all the little Huss children. So there she is sewing but the other SS wives at Auschwitz get jealous. So there is a whole community life for SS men in Auschwitz. They're encouraged to bring their wives and children to give a sense of normalcy, legitimacy to their work. They can come home and the maid will clean the filth and the blood off their boots. And they can sit down to a family dinner and the evening the wife can put on her lingerie and her nightgown and perform calming functions. This is actually part of their role. Where does the nightgown and lingerie come from? From Auschwitz. The underwear, Hedwig's underwear, she takes it from the luggage of murdered deportees. How is this even possible to have such intimacy with people who you consider subhuman, who are treated as, as vermin? It's just unbelievable, isn't it? And yet such is the greed and indulgence of the SS. They want their slave labor. They want these luxury goods. So the other SS women are jealous of Marta's sewing. And Hedwig eventually has to give in and she establishes the fashion salon in Auschwitz. As I described at the beginning of this talk, this beautiful gabled white building, which was actually the SS administration block. It was home to about 300 prisoners, in fact, who slept in a dormitory, much better conditions than in Birkenau. These were conditions that you could live in, survive in. And Hunya arrived at the SS admin block, this white building, after a horrific time in Birkenau. She'd been selected, not selected for death, She'd undergone a sewing exam, a kind of audition, and she'd been selected to work in the fashion salon. And to her, arriving at this salon near the Auschwitz main camp, just unbelievable. And she arrived in the very typical Auschwitz clothes. And again, this comes back to the, the saying that she had, clothes make a person, rags make lice, because when all of these young women were stripped on arrival at Auschwitz, they weren't given their own clothes back, fumigated or otherwise. The first arrivals were given filthy mud and blood and feces encrusted uniforms that had belonged to Russian POWs who had been murdered. Later arrivals got the infamous camp smock dress, the striped dress. And then when these ran out, they were flung any oddments of civilian clothes taken from the luggage of murdered deportees, clothes that didn't fit, clothes that weren't fit for purpose. And the whole point of this was to degrade, to humiliate, to mark the prisoners as other, while the SS had their smart uniforms, 
They had their leather boots, they had their waterproof capes, they had warmth and power and status. So Hunya arrives pretty much in rags at the ESS admin building. And she's welcomed, although at first nobody recognizes her because of her condition. Why did she get selected? It's all about connections again, friendship and family. Once Marta was capo, head of this workshop in the admin building, she began with the help of people who worked in the admin building. These are prisoners who are working as secretaries and filing clerks and so on. She began to see who else is in Birkenau. Who else can she save? So she chooses Irene Reichenberg because they're related by marriage. And this is literally a lifesaver for Irene because Irene had been struggling with deep depression. One of Irene's jobs was to work in the big storage, the big plunder warehouses of Auschwitz named Canada. There were several sites for this, the main one in Birkenau. And the job was to open the suitcases and look through them and sort clothes into categories and sizes and are they extra nice? or are they rags, clamotten? And while she was sorting through the clothes, Irene came across garments which had belonged to her sister Frida and Frida's little children. And by this she knew that Frida had been murdered. And already Irene had been in camp with two other sisters, Yoli and Edith, and both of them died. One from illness, one was murdered. And so no wonder, Irene said, there is no way of getting out of this. The only way out of Auschwitz is through the chimney. And Irene's best friend, Bracker, was an optimist and she said, no, we are getting out of here. We are going to have coffee and cake on the Corso in Bratislava. We are getting out and we are going to tell our story. Irene couldn't believe this, but every day Bracker dragged Irene to work. And one day Irene was selected to work in the fashion salon. And when she got there, she said, you know, I have a good friend called Bracha. You should get her in the salon. Sometime afterwards, Bracha was selected to work there. Straight away, Bracha said, you need a good coat tailor. My sister is a coat specialist. And Katka, who had a very weak heart as it happened, she was saved to the salon. And then they called on Renee, Renee Adler, uh, Renee Ungar as she was then, who was extremely ill at the time, they called her. Then some, some of the girls working in the sorting warehouses and the plunder warehouses, they found Hunya's passport. The documents and precious photographs of people arriving in Auschwitz were considered not valuable at all. They were set aside to be burnt. But someone found Hunya's passport and knew she was in Birkenau. And that's how her number came to be selected. So in these, these vast storage uh, plunder warehouses, the coats were bundled up and sent back to Germany into the heart of the Reich. And they were distributed by charities to victims of allied bombing raids, to people in need. There were no labels on these clothes saying this belonged to a Jewish person. In fact, the people in the warehouses had to unpick the yellow stars, you know, by law, which had to be displayed on Jewish outer clothing. And similarly, the SS were very happy to select the most luxurious garments from the plunder warehouses keep them for themselves, even though there was a very strict official policy of no theft whatsoever. There were investigations at Auschwitz. People were reprimanded, people were punished for stealing. And yet the commandant himself, his house was literally furnished with plunder and with the, the, the skills, the produce of slave labor, even his very tapestries and carpets were mended by enslaved laborers. So the clients come to the fashion salon, they browse the fashion magazines, they choose their designs. And it was the job of Marta Fuchs, this experienced cutter, to take the tape measure to them, to measure them. 
And I can't help thinking, what on earth was it like to be so intimate with people who are literally trying to kill you? What was it like, the tension in, in this workshop? The Nazis destroyed most records from the SS Edmund block, including records of the fashion salon, including the big black order book that Hunya said contained the very highest, the names of the very highest people in Berlin. So elite Nazi women in Berlin were ordering from Auschwitz. But these women were so good, these seamstresses were so good that there was a six month waiting list for the Berlin women because the Auschwitz SS wanted things first. So what was it like? Well, as I say, the records were mainly destroyed by the SS to cover up their crimes. And in testimonies, the, the survivors tended not to dwell on this aspect of it, the, you know, the technicalities of things. They spoke mostly of themselves, of their families, of the, their experiences, but very few details about the actual salon, with some exceptions. But I had the great good fortune to track down the last remaining surviving seamstress from this salon. And in 2019, I flew to meet her in California. And I'll tell you now who it is. Here she is. It's Bracha Berkovich. Bracha and Katka were the sisters. Bracha the optimist who said, we're going to get out of here. Well, Bracha survived 1,000 days in Auschwitz. She did survive at a cost. So I had a very interesting series of interviews with her. And I tell you, I didn't get a chance to ask many questions because she said, you listen. I listened, everything down. But one of the things I asked her, I said, well, you know, what was she like, Edvikus? You know, this, this, the wife of the Auschwitz Commandant, one of the most notorious men in Third Reich history. And Bracha looked at me and she said, hmm, she wasn't so special. The Frigo wasn't so good. She had four children. So Bracca was only thinking in terms of how to fit clothes, how to flatter a figure. But when we talked about it more, we also talked about the SS woman who was guarding the seamstresses in the fashion salon. Her name's Elizabeth Rupert. And I eventually found footage of Elizabeth Rupert in an SS prison after the war. It was very uncanny to see her, you know, her moving face. She's in the prison with Maria Mandel, no less. And Bracha said, you know, these women were of their time too. So as if the SS wives who came to this fashion salon were just caught up in it like everybody else. I beg to differ. In looking at the lives of the clients, it's very clear that all along the way, they made little choices. So Hedwig Huss joins a society that's inherently racist and anti-Semitic. She marries Rudolf Huss, who is posted to work in concentration camps. Hedwig goes with him. Hedwig raises her children in Dachau and Sachsenhausen and Auschwitz. And you'll find out when you read the book, she has zero compassion for these young women who labored to dress her. No word of compassion after the war. Hunya is uh, this, the remarkable Hunya. She I'm going to come to her in a moment, just before I finish. She also gave a great deal of insight into life in the fashion salon and the different seamstresses. And it was, it was through various testimonies and the interviews and memoirs that I was able to piece together and gather about 40 names. But my work is continuing because I know there were other women. I have just little nicknames, you know, little snippets, little stories. And since the book's been published, it has been wonderful that people have been getting in touch and, and sharing more stories and actually somebody was reading the book and they said oh my goodness I know that person <laughs> and we worked out it was their auntie Ella so read the book you'll find out so Huni had a lot to say and she talked about what it was like to interact with the SS and one time she said that she was sitting sewing and the SS guard SS woman Rupert said I had no idea that Jews could work so beautifully. She said, after the war, 
I'm going to open an atelier in Berlin and you can all come and work for me. And there's Honya sitting there who has come from Birkenau. She knows the reality. She knows there's no after the war. She's sitting there listening to this. So she says in Hungarian, she said, not on your life. And I imagine it was probably a little ruder than that. And the SS woman didn't speak Hungarian. So she says, what did you say? And Honya replies, sweetly, won't that be lovely? Just a little example of the tensions of working there. Now, you can read more in the book about another element that I think is incredibly powerful about this salon, and that is part of resistance. Because not only did Marta save at least 40 lives of women and girls who passed through the salon, she was also an active member of the Auschwitz underground. Resistance in Auschwitz? Yes. Staying alive was an act of resistance. Sharing your last bit of bread, sharing a word of hope, having a, a secret religious celebration in Auschwitz was an act of resistance. All of that, staying human, was an act of resistance. But Marta was linked with the communist uh, element of the underground, particularly because of her intimacy with the household. She still carried on working in the commandant's villa. And so with other prisoners working there, she was able to share information. She was able to send out messages. You know, they're trying to link with the Polish home army. She managed to smuggle out postcards and letters to her family still in hiding. And um, I do have facsimiles of this, they, they survive, which is extraordinary. And she linked up with one of the SS nurses, Maria Stromberger. She was able to pass on news, listen to on the radio from BBC broadcasts and spread hope, which was absolutely essential. So I think it's really important to acknowledge that although these women weren't wielding guns, they were very actively heroic in their own way in their connections, their camaraderie and what they did for other people. And in fact, Hunya said, we became united in sorrow and joy like a family. So in January 1945, Auschwitz was to be evacuated. And you can read how the women who'd survived thus far went on what became known as death marches. And here their camaraderie continued. They marched as the tailoring commando, the dressmaking commando. And yet there were escapes. And I hope you're intrigued enough to read about martyrs very daring escape. Unfortunately, the group of women that Marta escaped with were shot at by Germans and some of them were murdered. Marta survived. The bullet hit her as she was running away. It hit her in her backpack, which she'd managed to salvage from Auschwitz because she had connections and she survived. And she survived in hiding with some Polish Christians and she earned her keep while in hiding by sewing. You can read in the book how those who survived the, the death march came to Ravensbrück camp, which had been a huge center for sewing and fur workshops, how they went on to Malhof and how eventually liberation. Of course, it wasn't all happy endings. They had to return home and try and pick up their lives again. They made, there were some reunions, there were some joyful reunions, but then the reality hits. Are they welcome in Slovakia, in their home, hometown still? Can they earn a living still? Well, one of the first things they did was to try and get hold of a sewing machine. Start sewing again. And Marta, ingenious as ever, opened a new fashion salon, but this time she would not be sewing for the Nazis. She would be sewing as an independent businesswoman, and she invited her friends from the Auschwitz salon to come and work with her. So in the salon, they didn't just make ordinary clothes for the SS. They didn't just make clothes for children, which they did that too. They also made sumptuous evening gowns, Hunya said, which the SS women could not have imagined in their wildest dreams. And yet I've got to confess to you, between you, me and the internet, not all of them were great sewers. 
In fact, some of them came and they barely, barely knew how to do good dressmaking at all. Marta said, don't worry, you'll learn. And Bracha, when I spoke to her, she didn't continue sewing. She, she wanted to do something a little more cerebral. She worked in a publishing company. And she said, she said there were she said maybe 500 seamstresses in Birkenau. She said some of them had sewn in Paris. Some of them were couture sewers. She said, but if you didn't have connections, you didn't have luck. So it was really Marta's friendships and family connections that brought these women together. But so many other women and men, their sewing could not save them, not even a needle. But let's end on quite an optimistic note, I think, and let's return to Hunya. Hunya who said, clothes make the person, rags make lice. After the war, Hunya, survivor as ever, made it illegally. No, I think she was just legal. She made it to the British Mandate of Palestine, which of course becomes the state of Israel. And she got a little apartment eventually in Tel Aviv, but first she lived with family. And she carried on sewing for very well-established shops on George Allenby Street in Tel Aviv. I went to visit her home and just to see where she was and talk to her family and so on. But times were changing. Gone going, rather, are the days of the madame shop and the boutiques, and instead people want mass-produced clothes. And so Hunya eventually retrained to work on factory techniques, and she ended up working for a company called Gottlieb, set up by, uh, it's Gotex, Leah Gottlieb, and this, she created leisure wear, glamorous leisure wear, so a swimsuit here, and it might seem incongruous, but think about it, clothes tell a story. We don't know who actually made this swimsuit. I just bought it because it's the same label, the same company that Hunya worked for, but it could have been Hunya. Who makes your clothes? What's their story? So to finish, I am going to show you the most precious outfit in my collection. I tell you, my collection includes some wonderful things. I've got Dior, I've got 18th century embroiderers in my collection of vintage, but this garment is my favorite. If you can see, it is a two piece silky suit from the 1950s. It's got an incredible geometric pattern, a lovely pleated skirt. I know it's not showing up very well on the camera. Very smart cut, very nicely designed. This was upcycled from one of Hunya's dresses. So Hunya had the dress, but she wanted to turn it into a suit for her young niece, Gila. And Gila was a teenager, very slender, very stylish. So as Hunya sat sewing, Gila asked her to tell stories of her time in the camps, of her time before the war, her life in Slovakia. Hunya talked and sewed, Gila wrote it down. And that's one reason that we know so much about Hunya and about her time in Auschwitz and her survival in the fashion salon. When I first looked at this dress, uh, this suit, you know, it looks great on the outside, you look inside, it's made in a hurry. And I quite like that, that sense of, you know, Hunya's trying to get on, I've got my paid work, but I'm gonna make this for my niece because I love her. And that's the main thing. This garment is made with love. It was not made under duress. It was not made in a, in a concentration camp. Hunya survived and her story has survived with her. And as Braco Berkovich said, we are going to get out and we are going to tell the world what happened to us. Well, the world wasn't always ready to listen, but now I am so thrilled that we can share these stories of these, in some ways, ordinary women, but in other ways, remarkable women. Their quiet friendship and their heroism and their love. But I'll finish with two quotes from these women, one from Hunya. Hunya said to Gila, her niece, she said, don't become a seamstress. True, it saved my life, but you just sit there and sew. And then another quote from Marta Fuchs. 
Marta, this extraordinary compassionate woman, this, this quiet woman, this resistance worker, this, this woman who had to coexist with the people who, the very people who persecuted her, brilliant cutter, brilliant businesswoman, and continued her compassionate work after the war. Marta said that she continued sewing. She said, sewing saved my life. Why would I do anything else? So that is an introduction to the grotesquerie of a fashion salon in Auschwitz. It's a small introduction to just some of the women. And now I am so happy to answer questions. And also if you have anything you'd like to share with me, uh, one way is if you'd like to email me, you can Google Lucy Adlington uh, or Dressmakers of Auschwitz. My website has a contact form and I love to hear your stories and, and your insight. And I am, uh, I'm working on a new project now as well. So very much immersed in, in research. I'd very much like to show my appreciation, my thanks for being invited to speak today. It has been a real honor. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, thank you, Lucy. Um, I'm going through the questions right now, and it looks like you have, throughout the presentation, answered a lot of the um, questions. We only have a few more minutes, so I'm not going to... Um, so I'm here as long as you're here, so... Yeah, so that we are going to... Um, there was one question that I um, saw where people are asking if there were any documentaries or anything more about this topic, aside from your book and your other books, um, that you can recommend. Well, because essentially this book is the, the, first, um, the first account to be published widely about uh, the dressmaking salon, the stories of the dressmakers had been collated by a wonderful academic called Dr. Laura Shelley, and the salon had been mentioned by another fantastic um, academic, Irene Gunter, in a book called Nazi Chic. But as yet, you know, this is the first time all of these testimonies have been brought together and the photographs and so on have been shared. So at the moment, I can't recommend a documentary. Uh, I hope, I hope we get the opportunity to make one. I think that would be extraordinary. Thank you so much. And then people also in the chat have been sharing how they have um, family members or people they know that have, who were seamstresses or were sewing through the war. So um, this has definitely resonated with a lot of people. So many so, stories. Please share the chat with me afterwards. I, would I will, I definitely them. will. Um, and then thank you so much for joining us. It's been um, a very informative and engaging um, hour. I'm just gonna pass it off to um, CEO and President Michael Levitt just to say a couple more words. Thank you very much, Lior. Um, Lucy, I, I can speak for everybody because I'm reading through the, uh, the chat log here and the amount of appreciation. Um, that was a riveting presentation. And I think we've all become so used to, uh, to tuning in for, uh, to Zooms on all sorts of topics. But I have to tell you, that was absolutely fascinating. And, and thank you for bringing those stories to life for us all, those women's lives. Thank you for, for bringing them into our lives and our consciousness, because it was uh, just an incredible hour. We are all connected. I'm sorry, I didn't leave enough time for questions. I thought we had a little time over an hour, but I do also encourage people to, to email me with any questions I'm happy to answer. And, you know, really this, this history, it, it does deserve to be wildly told. I mean, there are so many stories, of course there are, and always so many more. So I'm very glad to be a very small part of, of rescuing these voices and sharing them. Well, um, on behalf of Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center, uh, I just want to thank you for being here with us today. And you're here, uh, it's May 30th. This is Canadian Jewish Heritage Month. So we're coming towards the end of Canadian Jewish Heritage Month, but what a wonderful way to be able to reflect. We have such a proud and strong Holocaust survivor community in Canada, not just the survivors, but the families and the lives that they've built that we've spent a lot of time over the last 30 days focusing on and talking about. And I think um, the fact that we're able to, uh, again, add this topic, this discussion into sort of our consciousness and understanding of all elements of what survivors have been through is again, uh, in, in May, more than any other month, even, even more precious. And uh, certainly in terms of the work of Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center, 
we really do focus on the lessons of uh, the universal lessons of the Holocaust in and advocating and standing up uh, against anti-Semitism and for human rights in all its forms. And I think you know you've you've given us a window when you talked about what was it like for the women to go in and work, uh, you know, in the factory, knowing that their very lives were being held in the balance, you know, the type of abuse that they would have um, been subjected to on the shop floor and how that, you know, the, 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 the nature of, of that relationship to, again, how they were able to be creative and keep on working. And I think that's, you know, it's a, it's a really good lesson. And in fact, I, I, I know that the issue of sort of human rights in the um, fashion industry and manufacturing sector is uh, something that's still very, very active. And from my time in Canadian Parliament, it was certainly an issue that we explored there as well. And, uh, you know, just something food for thought about, uh, again, the precarious, that, uh, precarious nature um, then and now. And if we're following the threads from the Holocaust and those lessons through, it must be a, a call to action to always um, be understanding the, the, the plight of those that can be, again, very much mistreated and subjected to, uh, to, to all kinds of abuse. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, it's something that I often think of now, you know, who made my clothes? What are their conditions? How are they treated? And I, I'm going to let you into another secret. Marta's son actually lives in Canada. So he is he is one of your locals. He there is we go. Uh, living, living and thriving and uh, yes, very much uh, a very supportive community. Well, thank you. That that really does tie it in and bring it full circle into the Canadian Jewish Heritage Month frame. So um, just before everybody leaves, I do want to give one pitch. Uh, and that is that uh, Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center, we are hosting our State of the Union, which will be in person this year for the first time in, in, in three years. We're getting back to in-person events. And we'd love you to join us for our State of the Union Voices of Change event, an in-depth conversation with three uh, incredible young dynamic entrepreneurs and social media influencers who are using their platforms to raise their voices against anti-Semitism and injustice. And the three are Lizzie Savetsky, Claudia Oshry, and Ryan Sagian. And that event is taking place on June 16th. And if you visit the Friends of Simon Wiesenthal Center website at fswc.ca, you can get all the details. And one last point, and that is that October 25th will be our Spirit of Hope event. We'll have much more to say about it in, in, the, in the next uh, three, four weeks, but it's going to be uh, a really incredible uh, event with a wonderful speaker and uh, look, looking forward to seeing many of you at our FSWC events over, uh, over the summer and, uh, and into next fall. So once again, Lucy, thank you so much. And uh, we, I know we all really appreciate everything you brought to us here today. It was my pleasure. Thank you and goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank you.